Holly Randall Unfiltered, where I am so, so excited to have one of the most famous porn stars in the world and a dear friend of mine who I have known for such a long time, the incomparable Lisa Ann. Hey, Holly. You know, I've known you since you were in school, and I remember you coming home from school uh, and walking up that long road, that long drive you had growing up, right? Yeah. You had to walk up that. I remember you coming into the studio when I was there with your mom, and uh, I think you were probably about 13. Wow. Maybe younger. Wow. Because it was like Crazy. 1995. The seat, no, so I graduated high school in 1996, so I would have oh, been... Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm thinking you're way younger than you are. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Then it was your, uh, your sister's younger, right? Yeah, my sister's eight years younger So than that's me. who was 13 when she was coming back from school. It was your younger sister. Um, but, yeah, we just have a lot of family history. I mean, yeah. your mom was... You know, your mom is the only woman that I ever met in porn my entire career that gave me this sense of confidence and this empowerment. And I remember what it was, was the first day I was on the ranch, she said, this is the ranch that porn built. <laughs> and she said, you can have whatever you want too if you work really hard. And that was like the most productive short conversation anyone ever had with me because there wasn't a lot of success for me to look towards. Right. So even though her and I had this difference in age, I felt like she was my only peer my, my whole career. Mm. Well, let's, so for people who don't know, let's give them a little bit of background about you yeah. and how you got started in the business and how you met my mom and all that kind of stuff. I'll keep it quick. Uh, for the short stuff, I was dancing at a club in Pennsylvania as a house girl. You know, that's when you just are a regular dancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had porn stars come in every week. And I watched these girls, Holly, and I thought, you know, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. They're so glamorous. First of all, the late 80s, early 90s porn stars were really glamorous. Yep. And they traveled like divas with tons of bags and wardrobe and their hair and makeup. And they were just really glamorous. And and I was like, these girls are doing the same thing I am, really. But they're traveling all over the world doing this. And I love the fact that they were a limited time offer. One of the hard things about being a house girl is... You get to know your regular customers too well. Yeah. And anyone with some common sense, remember, I didn't drink. I was underage, so yeah. I never drank when I started dancing. And then when I was of age, I was like, well, this is where I work. I'm not going to drink here, you know? Right, so I right. never drank. You have to have these conversations with dudes that you get to know so well, and you're naked. And no matter what, there's that <laughs> moment where you're like, this is weird, and I know <laughs> too much about this dude, and he's talking to me while I'm naked. You yeah. know what I mean? Meanwhile, he's married. He's got kids. I've got to know about his son's soccer practice. And I, I thought... <laughs> These feature dancers do not have to have these types of conversations. Right. And they're just in and out the door. I like this a lot. Yeah. So I gathered up the gumption to start interviewing these girls. And mm -hmm. I remember one of the first girls I interviewed was Christy Canyon. Oh, wow. And so I had my little notebook at their feature door, whoever would talk to me. I mean, some of the girls definitely slammed the door in my face. Right. But I spent two out, two years, two full years, Holly, of interviewing these girls. like With your little notebook. How do I get on the box cover? How do I get a contract? <laughs> who shouldn't I work for? Who should I work for? What should I be afraid of? Like, with my little notebook. So, you know, like the stats girl that I am, I put the stats together and I realized, okay, I want a contract. I want to be on the cover single in all of my movies, I don't want to share any box covers. I already had this weird sense of greed. I want my name incorporated in the titles so that when the VHS is, yes, I said VHS. When the VHS <laughs> is on the side at a store, you can still see my image and my right. name. Because I was going into adult bookstores and like scoping around and saying like, how is this girl more popular than this girl? And how is her stuff displayed? And, and also... I just love how you were, like, that focused from the beginning because, like, you literally, like, you have your shit together like nobody else that I know. Like, no one has their shit together like Lisa Ann does. So, like, the fact that, like, back when you were, like, how old were you? 18. Like, 18 at that time. You're, like, taking notes and oh. you've, like, got, like, a spreadsheet about, like, how you're going to be, like, the successful porn star. It's yes. just, like, that is so you. It's, it's so great. Me. It's so me. Even funnier is back then I used to work at a couple different clubs. And so my fans, since I had these regulars, they would follow me. So what I decided to do was I decided to make these little flyers where I wrote out Monday from 6 to midnight, I'll be at cloud nine. And on Tuesday, and then I would take them to Kinko's, have them cut printed on fluorescent paper, stand there with a paper cutter and cut them into four because I wanted to get as much as I could for my three cents a copy. Right. right so I got right. four. Like I was doing the budget <laughs> on this. Like how much can you spend on these? You know, and it, 
And it took off because the club owners realized this girl's good for business. Yeah. Like, she she's handling this. So after interviewing the girls, Lena was the closest to me because Lena came back about four times a year to Al's. And she introduced me to a man named Peter Davey. Mm-hmm. And Peter Davey was one of these men where back then there were these, they weren't really agents, but they were like brokers. They would right. take girls that they knew could get a contract. They would introduce them to people. They would broker the deal. He was great. I bought a one-way ticket. It was 4th of July. I flew on my first flight ever and got in the car and lived with a total stranger to make this porn dream come true. Wow. And it was flawless. He was never creepy. He was a wonderful man. I still thank him when I see him. Wow. Um, And from him, I got to do some side jobs and meet photographers until I got my contract with Metro. But the funniest thing about my contract is no one saw me naked until my very first sex scene. Wow, they just kind of... Well, when I was in Pennsylvania, I hired photographers to shoot photos, and I mailed the photos to all the companies, so they did see photos of me naked. Right. But back then, there was this thing where someone wouldn't ask you to take your clothes off in their office. That was just awkward, whereas now it's like, I remember taking girls on go and these creepy guys would be like, all the girls got to get naked in my office right now. And I'm like, really? In this horrible lighting, like, right now? Yeah. (laughs) That's awkward. Yeah, it is. But they would make them do this, and so... I got in at a time where women were really celebrated and they were really appreciated and they needed pretty girls to be in the business and there weren't as many girls. So it was just like, it was paradise for me. It, it really, was total paradise. And it was, so, you know, it's so different back then compared to the way it is now. I mean, it really was a very small industry. Very you know? small. And it wasn't like, you know, I mean, after the internet came around, it was like anybody and their mother could start you know, a porn industry, a porn business. But back then it's like you had to know somebody who knew somebody else who like, you know what I mean? I mean, you couldn't just like walk in and be like, hey, I'm going to start a porn company. I mean, you had to know somebody. So it was a very small insular community. And and there weren't a lot of girls that were willing to do that kind of stuff because it there wasn't weren't. as it was, accepted no, back then as it is now. No, even being a stripper now. was horrible back then. I right. would go to banks that wouldn't take my ones. I would go places that wouldn't want my business back then. So yes, it was very different. Interesting fact, in the two years of sending photos to California by mail to get into the business, there were things I had to do. So right away, I was told I needed a nose job. So I did it without asking any questions. I was like, if this is what I have to do, then next it was I needed boobs. So I did that as well. So I went through this surgery and kept sending updated photos and updated photos. And ironically, the very first time I met your mom, she did not like my nose. And she also did not like the fact that I have a scar below my belly button from when my appendix burst. When I was Mm -hmm. 13, I had to have emergency surgery, so there's a scar. Well, back then, we didn't have retouching. Nope. And it was either you're going to hold your hand there. So the first time I met your mom, she denied me. She was not going to shoot me. What I realized was the swelling in my nose had not gone down enough. Mm -hmm. The swelling in my boobs had not gone down enough, and I just needed to wait wait it out. Right. So I gave it six months, and I went back and saw her again. And that time, she was fine with me. So I was like, all right, I get to do this. Well, I love the fact that, like, that happened and instead of you just kind of giving up and being like, oh, okay, you know, I'm never going to make it. You're like, all right, well, I'm going to I'm gonna come back and I'm going to try again. And, I'm going to adjust. And that you could look at it in such, like, a um, kind of analytical way and see that, like, okay, it's probably, you know, the swelling here and this. And then, yeah. you know, and then I'll go back and I'll present myself again. And, you know, I mean, most people wouldn't you know, have the balls to do that. They get rejected. It's hard getting rejected, you know? I mean, when I was younger, I mean, I won't lie, I wanted to be a model when I was when I was a kid. Okay. I'm not necessarily a born model, but I wanted to be a model, you know? I mean, I grew up being surrounded by beautiful women right. and my mom, right. you know, was a glamour photographer. And, uh, you know, and I told her that and I remember my mom saying to me, she says, don't you dare. She was like, modeling is so hard and it is like, there's so much rejection that you have to face and people are so nasty to you and men treat you so poorly and you really should consider oh, a career behind the camera so much. where you have control. Cause she's like, you, as a model, you do not have control over your life. You don't. But what's fantastic is that that has all changed with the internet. But we'll get into that later. So let's hear more about True. like you and my mom and so all that um, fun and, stuff. and there was other photographers. Like I remember the first couple times I went to see Earl Miller. Oh God. He completely d- was disgusted by what I looked like. You know and what he so, does now, right? Yes, he shoots cats. He's a cat photographer. I love that. So he much. went from shooting pussy to shooting pussy. Oh, I go to his website on occasion. I'm not gonna lie. I, I, know. I, I, I have I do to. Too. It's he amazing. He has like pictures of like kittens on motorcycles. Oh, and like he's a, a catographer. It's amazing. It's amazing. But 
<laughs> he denied me in very nasty ways, you know? That's and a then surprise. I was at a trade show or an, award, or an award show here in LA and he came up to Metro and he's like, why haven't you brought me this girl to shoot? And I never told him. I never said I've gone to see him three or four times and he's denied me. I thought, this guy's either drunk or high, but he wants to shoot me and I want to shoot with him. Right. So I'm roll with it. Roll right. with it like we've never met before. Right. So I go to shoot with him and it was the absolute worst shooting day of my life. <laughs> and so... Can you I know, ask you a question? Did he put you in a really uncomfortable position and leave you there for a long time and go eat a sandwich? Um, we shot six sets in one day, and I didn't know what that meant. So I didn't know that we were going into different rooms and changing my look and doing all this. So there was like, he got maybe 12 magazine sets out of that one day. Oh, yeah. He refused to let me eat or drink water and told me the day before I shouldn't drink water either because it bloats you. So there was no water, no food. And I swear to you, I was on his set for 12, 16 hours. And by the time I got in my car, my blood sugar was so low, I could barely drive to a gas station and get a snack. Wow. But... I shot with him around the same time I was starting to really kick it up and shoot with your mom regularly. And she didn't mind that I was shooting with other people. But I came back to her and I said, what do I got to do to only shoot with you? And she said, you just have to tell the companies that you're only going to shoot with me. And they'll want to shoot you because I was shooting a ton of magazines. I went through a tear from 94 to 97, thanks to your mom, where I was like high society, like every cover, every magazine, which was awesome for feature dancing. Right. It gave me so much to sell. Right. And it put me on the newsstands. And I loved her work. So I was so proud. I mean, Earl didn't even give me my name. He just called me whatever. So like in one layout, I'm Gina. In another layout, I'm someone. At least your mom gave me my name. Like I was like. Lisa Ann, you know what I mean? Yeah. She's like, that's your name, you know? He didn't even, there was no care about the model at all or who she was. So, you know, when that when that happened, I said to her, well, this is great. You know, I was living in Huntington at the time. She had the studio right off of Santa Monica Boulevard. So it was an easy drive for me. I didn't have to come down from the valley. I was coming up. Mm-hmm. And I was just thrilled every time I got to be with her because, again, she empowered me to know that what I was doing was something I wanted to do, and I was creating the future that I wanted to live, whereas other people made you feel degraded. Other mm-hmm. people, like even shooting with Earl for that day, I never felt like less of a woman when I left that set. I just felt useless because the uncomfortable positions he would put you in, yeah. But then he would tell you you don't look good all the time. Yeah. He wouldn't say point your toe, arch your back a little bit more. He'd be like, your gut's hanging out. Can you do something about that? I'm like, what gut? I don't really think I have a gut, but okay. That's what, like, makes me crazy sometimes about when when I hear the way that other photographers speak to the models. And actually, I teach workshops as well. And one of the things that I talk about is how you talk to the models. So, for example, if the girl is her gut's hanging out, right? I am not going to say to her, your gut is hanging out. I'm going to say, stretch up through your belly a little bit more. You know, I mean, you say things a certain way so that you fix the shot so it looks right and you don't make the girl feel like shit. You know what I mean? Could this be why Earl is now shooting cats? Because all he needs now is catnip to get them to do what he wants. He can say whatever he wants to these cats. Do you think he tells the cats that they're too fat? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure he verbally abuses those cats. Are you kidding me? I'm sure. But from there, you know, my contract and being on the road and all of these adventures, and then let's just flash forward through all that to 2014, December, when I decided to retire. And one of the things about retiring that was tough was I loved what I was doing. But I hated the pressure being in front of a camera put on me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to stop obsessing about what I looked like. I wanted to stop with the like, oh, I have to get my nails done. I have to tan. I have to do this. I just wanted to live a life that didn't revolve in such an ego-filled atmosphere where I felt like what I ate, what I did, every little move was making such a difference. And the irony is... Two years later, I'm in way better shape than I was when I was in the business. I know. You look amazing. My skin is better. Um, I'm sleeping better. I'm happier. And I realize it's because I eliminated that pressure. Right. Because when you're under that pressure, you roller coaster. Oh, my god. Like, gosh. I would binge eat at times just because I'd be on vacation. Like, oh, I can eat whatever I want. Not shooting for four days. Right. And then before I was going to shoot, I would just be like, okay, I'm going to do 10 hours of cardio in three days. And I'm going to, you know, I mean, I, was, I, I could reel it back in and take five pounds off in three days. That's not healthy either. Yeah. <laughs> now it's just like I don't need to reward myself with a whole pizza because I had a 
shitty day on set. Right, right. And, you know, I mean, I, I honestly don't know how you... I have so much respect for models and the girls that put themselves out there, you know, and, and especially, you know, modeling nude in, in front of, you know, millions of people to see. I mean, that's fucking terrifying. I mean, I won't take my clothes off in front of the camera because I'm a fucking chicken shit. But, I mean, I had a, uh, a, a TV show on Playboy TV, Adult Film School, and even just that show, you know, and there was like a three, three four seasons... I couldn't watch. I couldn't watch it. I could not watch myself on TV. Like, I just started to pick myself apart. Oh, it's oh. every single oh. thing that was wrong with me. I mean, I would just sit there and watch myself and go like, I need so much plastic surgery. I mean, I it really started to fuck with my head. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was kind of glad when the show was canceled because I just felt like it was not good for me. Like, I understand. It's not healthy. Yeah. It and, gets to a point where it's just and, not healthy. And I just couldn't take, like, and, and nobody was criticizing me. Everybody was being very nice to me. But, you know, my own, the critic in my own head was just, like, really letting me have it. And so. when I was shooting, I would do stupid shit, like, that would never happen to me now, right? Like, down here I have this scar, which I don't know if you can see it, but... Right before a trade show, I was I was in my apartment in New York, and I was trying to sear a piece of fish in a way that I'd never done with flame before. And I was watching a YouTube video on my iPad, and me, and it, somehow the grease splashed up and burned me. And I was like, you know, a, a human being getting burned is bad, but when you're a nude model, yeah. and when everyone wants to look at your cleavage, and yeah. this is your focal area— Oh, this is real bad. So the next day, I remember walking to Aldo and all these different shops in New York and showing the girls my situation and buying accessories that I then put bandages on and taped to my skin for like the next <laughs> two months of trade shows. And you'll notice there was a period in 2013 to 14 where every scene I'm wearing an ungodly huge People necklace. Like, well, like wow, she really weird. into the accessories. She like, likes the no, chunky necklace look. <laughs> no, I was covering and like, I can, when it was taped on me, like I'm not, here I am I'm I'm at the Jersey Exotica rolling up band-aids into donuts knowing that I can get them on there and get the necklace to sit perfectly so even when I move for a photo, no no one was going to see my third degree burn under there. And this is and this is quintessential Lisa Ann, like the fact that you can problem solve like that, you know, and, and find a solution to like this big burn on your chest with like yeah. specifically strategically placed <laughs> necklaces and like certain like tape. And like, I mean, it's just like, well, well, you, you got to be a survival of the fittest, man. I grew up watching MacGyver. I know anything that happens to me. I can get it. I can I can resolve. I can task this. I can figure this out. I mean, it's already happened. I'm not. You know, I grew up in a family where both of my parents were like, they cried over spilled milk. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they flipped out over little things. I just remember so many times growing up thinking, when I grow up and I'm on my own, I am not going to freak out when shit has already happened. Now when something happens, I, it's like, oh, well, that wasn't supposed to happen that way. Now it's time to figure out what's the solution to try and get it done. Like, how are we going to walk through this fire and get to the other side and be over it? Yeah. Because the worst part is dwelling on it. Yeah. The burn, it was hellacious. But I was like... All right, that just happened. Okay, that looks hideous. We're going to have to figure out a solution. Luckily, it was a time where big necklaces were actually in style, and it wasn't hard to find them. Right. <laughs> a little investment of 100 bucks, and no one knew. So, so, you, were, so you, you obviously shot quite a bit when you were younger, and then you left the business for a while, yeah. and then you came back. I did. In 1997, we had a calamity of events with an HIV scare that turned into being a much larger HIV scare than we realized. We had Mark Wallace, who yep. was actually working in the business, and he was positive, and it just freaked me out. And all within one week, that happened. It was right when my contract was up, so I wasn't tied to anybody. I flew to Florida for a feature dance booking. And I met my husband the first night of that booking. So it was a combination of me running from my past and trying to create a new future that I met him. And after a week of doing ecstasy and having amazing sex, I flew back to California and told my friends, I'm going to move to Florida to be with this guy that I just met last week. He's amazing. Wow. So seven years later, I got back in the business after we broke up. But it wasn't really my intention to get back in the business. I went back to work as an agent. Uh, and yes. when I was at this agency, you know, I was 35. Mm -hmm. So, like, in my mind, no one shot girls in their 30s when I was in my 20s in the business. So I was thrilled just being back in the business, being in my comfort zone, being around other porn stars and, and just being able to be myself. And then the MILF thing happens. Yeah. 
Right. And all of a sudden, Perfect Desperate timing. Housewives is on TV, and people are calling the office like, Lisa, would you ever shoot again? And I'm like, I'm way too old to shoot. People don't shoot girls my age. We don't even know where they go. You know, <laughs> that was kind of my thing. And and it was your mom, of course, that I wanted to shoot my first uh, scene back with, and I did. And she shot me as an agent and had this wardrobe stylist and this beautiful fur coat. And I did a boy-girl scene with Christian, who I chose for the reason of this. I wasn't feeling my thinnest then because I wasn't in front of the camera. And mm-hmm. I was extra uncomfortable. And when Derek said to me, who are you going to shoot this scene with Suze with? And I said, well, I want it to be the biggest guy in the business that's going to make me look the tiniest. And Christian's that's Christian a pretty Triple big X. guy. He's 6'4". Yeah. Yeah. And he's this big dude. Yeah. I didn't want to be with James Dean yet because yeah. like, he would make me look fat. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> James Dean makes everybody look yeah, fat. So like to me, it was like I was again me always overthinking it and like yeah, of course. Um, so coming back was different because the internet had changed everything, yeah. and so for me it was like whoa, it was my first time ever shooting Gonzo. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? What do you mean? I'm in at nine and I'm leaving at one. Yeah, right. What do you mean they're shooting another scene after me? Where's the dialogue? Like, yeah. What's happening? Oh, what do you mean? There's no 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 wardrobe, no nothing. A barely a makeup artist who comes in and out. Yeah. You know, it was just like, it was a lot for me to digest. I was like, oh, this is more like homemade. It felt more homemade mm-hmm. than it felt like a production from the 90s. I remember my parents saying, because they like totally battled against, um, you know, starting to shoot video for Susanette. Because, you know, my mom's very much at her heart a photographer. But they had shot some movies back in the 70s. And my mom would always say like, shooting movies is like going to war. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just like so much. But back then, I mean, they've snipped the film, like, physically cut the yeah. film and, like, would hang it, you know? I mean, that was back before, like, modern editing and obviously way before digital. So back then it was a huge production. It but was. But back then you made lots of money doing yes, it. Yes, so you could yes. actually afford to do those things. Now you can't yes, because totally nobody different. fucking pays for porn. Well, remember your mom used to have a massive amount of people on set. There'd oh, be yeah. a wardrobe girl who would have boxes and boxes and boxes of accessories. There'd be an assistant. There'd be the makeup artist who would stay all day. It would take three hours. Emma would take three hours yeah. easy to do your makeup. Yeah. Your hair was so amazing. You never wanted to sleep on your head again. You just yeah. want to have that hair. Yeah. And you know, a, a, a backstory with you and your with your mom in the studio on Santa Monica in the early, like I'd say this was probably like 95, 96. I wanted to shoot with Rocco so bad. And this was when Rocco was just a dreamy, exotic lover on camera. So this is Rocco Sofredi for anybody who doesn't know who he is. He's a very famous kind of old school porn star. He was very handsome. Very. Your mom loved him. My mom she loved, loved shooting him. <laughs> so, but you know, Rocco's style has changed a bit. I probably wouldn't shoot with Rocco <laughs> yeah, today. Quite you know? a bit. You know, I, I watch, I watch tape and I'm like, eh, you know, not so much my thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I said to your mom, I said, you know, I can't shoot with Rocco for Metro, who I was contract with, because they uh he wanted to keep foreign rights. He wouldn't work for any companies who wouldn't allow him to keep foreign rights. And right. Metro was not having that. And so your mom says, Well, I can shoot you in a magazine and I'll let you have sex with them, little piggy. You know, she <laughs> always, you know, she says little piggy. She does. She loves she <laughs> loves so, that word. She's a little piggy. And I said to her, You will. So later on, she actually got to use that on her site. Yeah. And I was so thrilled because I got yeah. to watch it. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I actually there is tape that shows I did get to have sex with Rocco's Freddy. And it was so beautiful. <laughs> I remember it was so funny because, you know, back when we shot magazine layouts, you know, it was all softcore. Right. And so you couldn't show penetration. Not only could you not show penetration, but the guy's penis couldn't even be fully erect. It had to be like at a 45 degree angle. So it wasn't like pointed directly like at the vagina. Exactly. So it was, it was like kind scary. of like. Scary. Yeah. It he was had to hold himself. So weird. Did you have to take the Polaroid and peel it off? And yeah. you have to stay in that position for three minutes while the Polaroid, because you can't move because yeah. it's lit. Yeah, you while the Polaroid develops. And so it was so great because later when we launched Suzanette and we were able to go back and, you know, take all this old footage and all these pictures and then rescan them and put them on the internet, we were able to find a couple of these shots where the guy kind of stuck it in the girl, you know, because they were like having fun on the side. But you couldn't use those shots back then. But now with the internet, we could totally use them. And it was like a gold mine finding the these shots. The fact that your mom was so cool to me that day and actually allowed more time on set for me to actually be able to have sex with Rocco in between her shooting Oh, my photos. mom's a generous woman like that. <laughs> so generous of her. <laughs> who's her, who's going to stop you from enjoying yourself? I was so happy and she made me so happy by letting me do that. Just I look back on that magical moment when I look through that old magazine. I did save one copy of all of my magazines because it's fun to look through. Yeah, yeah. I still it's have, a, look back I still have a bunch of my old 
old ones, like the when I very first started getting like covers of magazine layouts. I mean, first of all, magazines don't really exist that much anymore anyways, but like, you know, I stopped saving them a long time ago. You know, we used to not know when we were going to land in the magazines. You know yeah. this. You yeah, don't yeah. know when it's going to land. And I remember loving living in the valley or coming up to the valley to shoot and stopping at those magazine stands where they weren't even in plastic yet. Yeah. And the guys would let you troll through all the magazines to see which ones you were in. And then they would like, oh, you sign one for me. I'll give you a bunch of these. And that's, yeah. how, that's how you'd know what magazines you were in by just going through. You'd be that girl standing on the street corner looking through all the Curvy magazines. I know. People just looking at you as they drive by, and I thought nothing of it. Yeah, no. Say, I remember going into uh, magazine stands and just like going through porn and like buying a bunch of porn, and people just looking at me like, "What the?" Because, like, you know, I mean, nobody knew who I was. Right. You know, people see you and they probably see like, "Oh, that's Lisa Ann." Like, but for me, I was just like this young blonde chick, and they're like, "Wow, that girl's got a fucking like porn addiction problem or something." <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> and then looking back to now, you know, when we talked about me wanting to be removed from the camera in 2013, I got an opportunity to leave the adult radio show I was doing for which was Playboy, then it was Spice, then it was Manwin, you know, Mm -hmm. that whole channel. And I got an opportunity to work in sports with Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. And I promised myself that if I got a second contract, I would completely plan my demise. So I would completely retire and focus on this as my new thing. Right. And when I first started at Holly, everybody said to me, oh, you know, you should be doing videos and you should be. And I'm like, you guys don't get it. That's the point. I want to be on radio. I don't want my face out there. Yeah. I don't want to be shooting um, informational videos on sports stuff because then again, I'm going to be analyzing the video, looking at what I look like. And right. now I haven't really looked at myself for a year or so and be even harder on myself than I was before because I'm just getting older and that's right. just normal, right? right? The normal things you look at when you've gone from your magazine layout in 1994 and then you see yourself on camera in 2017, it's just horrifying. So why right. expose myself to that? So... My sweet spot is this right here, radio. I don't have to have makeup on. I don't have to worry about what I look like. like it, none of it matters. And all I get to do is, is just be use my personality now instead of my looks. And I, I'm thrilled. So tell, so tell us a little bit about how you, I mean, how did that whole thing happen with um, Sirius Radio and getting all the sports? And, and also, too, like even to backtrack a little bit more, like when did you first start getting into sports? Because like... I mean, I'll be honest with you. I could give a fuck about sports. Like, it is. But your mom's a diehard Lakers fan. Yes, she is. You're a diehard Lakers fan. But I'm fan. just not. Re- I mean, actually, my boyfriend's recently been kind of getting me more into hockey because he plays. Good sports for you to get into. You know why I like hockey? Because it's fast and violent. It's fast and That's violent. Why I and they like play it. great music at hockey games. <laughs> they do. Great music, <laughs> they right? Do. It's like a little headbanger music. They do. Like, it's, it, it's quick. Yeah. So I was a sports kid growing up. Um, My older brother played sports. My mom was what you call a basketball mom at a local college. Mm -hmm. So basketball moms will go and cook meals so the home and the away team have a home-cooked meal before the away team gets back on the bus. That is nice. So we, our lives for all of basketball season revolved around Lafayette College. That is just so the opposite of my mom's behavior at basketball (laughs) games. Let me just tell you about, like, okay, so. I've gone to Laker game with your mom. Yeah, but the worst is when her children are playing. (laughs) So, like, we all had to play sports. Me, my brother, and my sister, when we were kids, my parents were very, like, adamant about physical activity. I mean, I rode horses all my life, but I also played sports as well. I played basketball, actually. And my brother played basketball, and my sister played volleyball. And um, we used to, like, my brother especially used to, like, not tell my mom when he had games. Shut up. She was so embarrassing. She would come to the game and she would just scream these obscenities. And this is a high school game, right? And she'd be like, kick him in the fucking balls. You know, I mean, just shit like that. I was like, mom, you can't say that. She would start fights with the moms from the other I team. I so shit much. you not. I love it so There was much. a time that my brother was playing this opposite team and he and like this kid just got into it. I don't know. They didn't like each other. And so then like my mom started started um, yelling, you know, whatever. And then the mother of the other kid, um, like, talked back to my mom. And then they just fucking got into it. I love and, like, it. Me and my sister to, like, pull them apart. <laughs> and it was just, like, my brother's, like, down there on the floor just being like, oh, my fucking I get God. It. I get my it. mother, like, I mean. Worse she, than LeVar Ball. Oh, dude, she's the worst <laughs> at sports games. So, like, when we were kids, it was like, fuck, my mom's here, fuck and you can just hear her up in this oh yeah and her accent everything to her sound oh, just her voice God. carries and just the obscenities and she's 
I love it. <sighs> oh, so, so that was the start of it. And then, you know, I only saw my dad on Sundays. And my dad watched football all day on Sundays. So him and my brother would have conversation. It was kind of sad for me because I realized the only way for me to join this Sunday visit is to learn football. Mm-hmm. So I learned football so I could have a conversation with them. And believe it or not, that just started everything. And what was great about being on the road, my first couple of years, I had to travel alone. You know, when mm-hmm. you're traveling alone, it's lonely. Yeah. But ESPN was in every hotel. And this is before we had Netflix, everybody. This mm-hmm. is before you had a million options. You had about eight channels per city mm-hmm. and you didn't know what they were. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing on except Sports Center would replay, replay, replay. And I'll tell you, following sports kept me probably from getting deeply into alcohol or drugs on the road mm. because I would follow each sports city that I was going to, their teams, so then I would meet people in the club or at the airport wearing their hats or their gear. And I would be able to make conversation about players on the those teams with those people. And it made them feel so special that I cared about their city, their team, their players. Mm -hmm. And then I started to take it to the next level. When I started traveling with somebody, I would reach out to the club and say, I'm going to go to the baseball game on Saturday afternoon. Sometimes the clubs would have a radio station hookup where I could get tickets. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they knew somebody. But I started to take it to the next level and see all the stadiums, all the arenas. and, and, And then you're really engaging with not just your fan base, but with the community that you're submerging into for that week to work. Yeah, and I, sports really brings people oh, together. It really brings yeah. people together. And I loved what I got from it. I loved learning about each different city and the vibe of their crowds. Like, my favorite baseball stadium will always be PNC Park, which is in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a little family area where all the food's a dollar. And I just think that's so great. The waters, the drinks, the, 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 the hot dogs, everything. And you just see tons of families there. And everybody's gracious and kind and friendly and not swearing. They're real aware that there's children around. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you go to like, you know, New York, if you go to Yankees game, everybody's swearing. Or like, just you know, any game that my mother's at. Or your mom's. <laughs> so that, that whole thing was my outside interest. And just recently was the premiere of After Porn Ends. Mm-hmm. And it was in March. And I'll say this to everyone with understanding that I want you to know that I believe that there's a lot of successful people in this business and a lot of su- successful talent. And But you have to understand they're not the ones normally showcased in these documentaries. No. And they're also not the ones that are around because the successful ones are off working and doing what have you. And after watching the first one and then the second one, I said to myself, like, why do I feel like I escaped a fire and I'm the only one that got out that wasn't burnt? Yeah. I have a little bit of survivor's guilt yeah. where I feel myself trying to reach out to some of these women and really help them and introduce them to people that maybe buy autographs or teach them how to be better on their social media. And I'm spending a lot of time right now. I told myself I'd give 10 hours a week to other people to try and facilitate their next step, you know? And what I've had to say to myself is... We all had the same choices. You made different choices. And your motivation is different and your will is different and your reality sense is different. You know, the the horror of looking towards turning 50 and not having savings and a life set up is so horrific to me, but I can talk to other women and they're just like, you know, you know, I'll figure it out. You know what I mean? And so I have to take a step back and realize not everybody lives with the same fear as I do. This you same, can't save the world. You can't save the world yeah. and you can't motivate people. If no. they're not motivated, they're not motivated. I mean, there's a lot of people in other industries also who don't have a retirement plan or don't have a backup plan. And the thing is, is like the adult industry is like any other entertainment industry. If you're in front of the camera, like you kind of have an expiration date totally. after a you while. Totally. shelf life. For, for the most part, you yep. know, I mean, obviously there's exceptions, but I mean, that's something that you've always got to think about. And the thing is the porn industry can be so great for some girls coming in because you can make a fuck ton of money really quickly, um, you know, more so than you could in almost many other industries. Sure. And if you're smart with your money and if you're smart with your choices, you can really set yourself up to have a great retirement plan and to have a future or maybe move behind the scenes when you're done. But, you know, sometimes a lot of these people don't think that. And I don't want to say, like, it's, these girls because it's not like, all oh, porn no, stars are stupid. No, it's it's just, people in general. It's too fast and furious at too young of an age. Right. It's no different than when the NBA signs a 19-year-old and he spends all of his money by 22. Right. It's no different. Exactly. He doesn't know if he's going to break a leg and never get picked up on his off his rookie contract. Like, he doesn't know that. But when you're young, you don't think that way. Because you think you're indestructible. 
So my having this side love for sports and the fact that I was always talking sports with fans, well, they started calling my radio show when I was doing my show for Playboy. Mm -hmm. And it would be people I met on the road, and they'd start talking sports with me. And then every time I'd be done with my show, I'd get in a little bit of trouble. Like, you know, this is Playboy radio. You're not supposed to be just talking sports. I'm like, yeah, but that's what these people are calling to talk to me about. So I should talk about it, right? So this went back and forth, back and forth for about four years. And then one day was my lucky day, and Farrell came to me, and he said, you know what? There was a fantasy sports show, and it was all Playboy Playmates, and it just broke up. Why don't you reach out to Matt Deutsch in New York City, and why don't you see if he's willing to let you go on air and talk sports? He's like, because we just can't anymore. We just can't. So at one moment, I'm getting almost fired, right? Yeah. And then I'm realizing, okay— I flew to New York. I met Matt Deutsch. He gave me the summer to learn fantasy. I knew all sports, just did not know fantasy sports. I knew really nothing about baseball. Mm -hmm. So I really had to study the game of baseball. I took a year to do that. Then last year was my first year playing fantasy baseball. I finished in last place. This year is my second year playing. I have not fallen below third. I'm holding second today, hoping to be in first. I want to win this league, but I'm growing. I forced myself to grow. And this morning I set my alarm last night. And I was laughing because I said, the only time I have to set my alarm is to take a 7 a.m. spin class. That's it. I work Monday night and Saturday afternoon. I do prep throughout the week because I want to stay good at this. And I want to show my boss that I'm so grateful for this opportunity because this fills my time in such a positive way. I've Mm -hmm. met some of the nicest new people in my life in fantasy sports. Um, But the fact that, yeah, if you do it right and you save your money... You can do whatever you want later. You don't have to be as in fear of what's my next job going to be. And I remember actually, remember when Johnny Sins came in the industry? Oh, yes. And I was t- his agent. And you, I he know. Was the and only you client took I took to an agent lunch. Like I was Ari from Entourage. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember like you, you really kind of sat him down and, and, you know, you kind of explained to him, you know, because you really care. He's an awesome guy. He's an awesome guy. And you were like, look, you know, like... I want to help you make this like a longevity thing for you and, and help you make smart decisions. And I remember like you said that he took your advice and you were very, he is my most proud, very proud of him. one of my most proud. I realize now that there've been a couple lately that have come to me and thanked me after years mm-hmm. and have said, you really had an impact on my life. And I didn't realize it then, but I do now. And it's been so emotionally touching. Yeah. But Johnny Sins is killing it. He's done yeah. everything and more. Yeah. So proud of him. Yeah. He's doing great. Have you met his girlfriend? Kissa? Yes. Oh, she's the sweetest. They're so cute together. They're so cute together. They're the only people that I like stalk their Instagram. I know. Like, me too. I want to like everything. I, I know. Like, I'm like, like I want to be in love. Like you're in love. They're beautiful. He's a beautiful person. He's I know. also from Pennsylvania, from outside of Pittsburgh. Oh well, see now we know. That's PA, why. PA people, we got some motivation. <laughs> there is something to say about to say about people from the East Coast. I don't know. It's funny because a lot of people who work from here from the East Coast, and there's like a there's like a real work ethic. Yeah, where it's like. To us, it's an insult if you're right on time or late, a total insult. So we're always 15 minutes early. Like there's these weird things that are like bred in your mind Mm -hmm. as an East Coaster. Like, no, you got to be on time. You can't be late. You know, whereas West Coast people, when I first moved out here, everyone's just casual about like, I'm almost there, you know, I'm 20 minutes late. I'm like, and no one gets upset. And I'm like... What are you talking about? I remember, actually, funny story about that. I remember I was having a party, and this was right when um, our friend Brian had moved into <gasps> town, right? And, like, I barely knew the guy. And uh, I was having a party at my from house. Ohio. He's from Ohio. And he shows up. So I said, like, I told everyone, I'm like, okay, party starts at 8 or whatever. So he shows up at 8. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? He's like, the party started at 8. I'm like, bitch, this is L.A. You come two <laughs> hours after they tell you when the party starts. Are you crazy? Who comes to a party on time? Especially if you don't really know the person. He was like so confused. <laughs> so Because he's from Ohio. <laughs> yeah. He was I like, mean, that's I, I don't totally understand. understandable. It's East Coast people. We just have a different a different worth that, or a little different thing with our watches. Like, yeah. It's real important to us. But, yeah. Um, was that ringer our ringer? No, it wasn't. It was my uh, meter. But we make you do push-ups for things like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Standing on the back. Yeah, I, that was my penalty for my staff when they were late when I had my agency was push-ups. Oh, my God. And that's because funny. it's just like some people are late and some people are on time. You yeah. gotta accept that in life. That's yeah. just what it is. Like, you can't change a person that's a late yeah. person. But sometimes I'd sit on Robert's back, the front desk guy I had for a couple of years, because he was late so many times. I'm like, all right. And I'd sit on his back, Indian style, and say, so you have to do an extra 20 with me on your back. <laughs> and we'd take pictures. <laughs> he must have gotten so buff. Yeah, he got a little <laughs> bit buff. Um, okay, so, so 
Tell us about tell us about your book. Tell so, us about the life. The life. Uh, there are some copies of the life for some of you lucky listeners that are going to go out there and like this podcast because that is so important in the podcast world. Make sure that everybody follows and likes your podcast and also Very commentary, important. stars, all of it. It all adds up. So those of you who do those exercises can get a copy of the life. And this is really just kind of what we talked about kind of a getting in to a getting out, some of the randomness in between. Um, There's a lot of your mom's shots in there. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful picture that you took. You shot my book cover, which I think is pretty momentous. Yeah, I think that's pretty awesome. You shot the book cover at your mom's house, the, you know, the ranch in the studio. Like to me, it was so spiritual and it was so all connected. And then your mom came up and she had a white shirt on when I was wearing my white dress. We looked like we were twinning. Aww. And I was so touched by that. Like in the videos, you could see that I'm like welling up because I can look at your mom anytime and almost want to cry to the, the gratitude I have of how different my life may have been without her. That's amazing. Yeah. I feel the same She was way. so positive. <laughs> Such a position. She, she was just like, she was a baller. And I was like, yo, you can be a baller. Like, this is the ranch that porn bought, Lisa. And I was like, oh, this yeah. is a possibility? Because all the girls live in crackhead apartments that I've seen so far. I'm going to follow your lead, not yeah. theirs. I mean, she's, yeah. I mean, she's like, my mom is probably one of the only people who I know who isn't afraid of anybody. No. Nope. I mean, she's not afraid of anyone. No. Nope. Like, it's crazy. I I'm, I'm feel like I'm scared of everybody. <laughs> like, but what? she's just like, yeah. I mean, she's such an incredibly strong, um, you know, role model and such a strong figure, you know. And I mean, so, you and are such a as great well. sense of humor. You know, when I was coming up to set the wardrobe up for us to do this two day shoot for the book cover and for some promo that you did that I love that Sirius uses and we all enjoy, um, I was putting some clothes in. Your mom said to me, So, how's it been since you retired? And I said, Well, you know, it's weird. Like, everyone hates me and they hate my guts. And she goes, oh, that's okay. There's nothing more boring than a room of pornographers sitting around talking with each other. And she just walked off. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, well, that's just like summed up. I've been crying over this for seven months. And your mom just summed it up like, that's no big deal. She said, yeah, she would say the exact same thing about award shows. I'm like, because I've gone to like accept like awards for her for like lifetime achievement. She's like, I'm not going. She's like, there's nothing more boring than a room full of pornographers, darling. And I was like, and she's all right. So, but she's so right. And the way she says it is just like, because the rest of the world would love to be in a room with pornographers. Yeah. They would think this was a very yeah. exciting room. Yeah, we're really not that interesting. <laughs> some of us are. Some of us are. Well, some, some of us are. Some of us are. Uh. So the adventures of my life are in here. And the new book I'm writing is really going to be about uh, transition. Mm. You know, no one really showed me what it was going to be like on the other side. And no one really showed the world yet what it was going to be like when a woman who's as well-known as I am for one thing decided to go on the other side. I mean, I feel like, honestly, you are, like, one of the ultimate success stories. You know, I mean, there's been other people yep. who have achieved fame and then tumbled, yep. sadly. Yep. Um, and, you know, I mean, you've really you've really held strong. I would say, like, I mean, a real success story about, you know, like, life after porn would be you and, like, off the top of my head, like Sonny Leone, you know, yeah. who's huge in Bollywood, yeah. which a lot of people don't know here because they don't. I read about her all think the time because I think she's India. so beautiful. Yeah, she's. I mean, she's fuck, dude. That girl's amazing. And she's glamorous. Like, I mean, she has crossed over into mainstream big time, but it's in India, so you never hear about it over right. here. But I mean, the fact that you know you're like a huge figure now in like you know the the radio sports world. I mean, that's 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 incredible to make that transition, and and also too, I mean, it, that must have been hard, not just as a porn star, but as a woman. Also, right? I mean, isn't it kind of like a real boys club? Uh, the sports world, yeah. But the interesting thing about sports are if you know your shit, eventually you'll get your way through. So yeah. I just knew I needed to study. I knew when I spoke with people, I needed to know what I was talking about. I knew, I mean, girl, there were days for this baseball season, I committed three months, five hours a day where my phone was off. I was just studying baseball. I was just learning every position, every player, every team, minor leagues, who's scouting, ballpark advantages, weather, everything. Because I know what I bring in social media presence to the right. company, but I also want to bring the smart. So the boys club thing wasn't as bad. And fantasy sports is this beautiful little small world of all of us statisticians who just love to be geeks and look at the, the the bottom side, the underbelly of real sports. Right. I would say it would be very hard for me to get into the sports world, which is mm -hmm. not something I desire to even try because I don't want to be subjected to that much uh, negativity. Mm -hmm. But in fantasy, it's like I traded one fantasy for another fantasy, and I, it's yeah. the perfect transition. And fantasy 
these words are so popping right now, right. you know. But what's been neat has been my personal interactions. Mm-hmm. And it's been neat to watch people who were a little uncertain at first really understand, like, just because a woman does porn or a guy does porn or a person's a pornographer or a photographer or whatever doesn't mean they're any different than you. Yeah. We're so not aliens. We're not aliens. <laughs> we don't need to be treated as less of people. Right. It's who, what do we show you? And so it's been really the most interesting part of the transition has been getting out there with my sense of pride of being like the first girl to have a billion views on just Pornhub alone over the 10 years Pornhub has been in business. So think of all the other sites and I'm embracing my past and telling the world like, yo, it's up there for you to enjoy forever. If you want to take this journey with me to this new world, we'll still be comedian, you know, communicating, but I didn't want to be on a balance beam. I didn't want to be on a tightrope. I wanted to be able to embrace my past, tie it in with my future and still have a little fun with both. I think that was the hardest for me. Yeah. That was the hardest because it was like, how am I going to do this? Yeah. I mean, and you know, the stigma that porn carries with it. I mean, I, you know, I work behind the camera. So I don't even, I don't get nearly as much flack as, you know, you girls who have performed in front of the camera. And that's got to be, that's got to be really hard. It's hard. And it's also like, you know how it is with people being so much more expressive in a negative way in today's Mm -hmm. world. Like people feel it's okay to type just something completely offensive to a stranger. Yeah. Like, why should I take sports advice from you when you used to take dicks in your ass or you should have a cock in your mouth right now? I mean, that's by the thousands on a daily, you know? Yeah, I mean, those keyboard warriors on social media because you don't have to take responsibility responsibility for the things that you say because these people would never say this to your face right because they're fucking interesting chicken shit. is i my first year out and about i realized i'm not on set i'm not on the road with a security guy and i'd be out and about and people would say fucked up things in my face i remember sitting at a beautiful restaurant having lunch with my girlfriend in new york and this guy came up and tapped me on the shoulder while i had food in my mouth to ask for a photo and i said to him no i said i'm eating and he looked at me and goes well fuck you then i'll never jerk off to you again in this really nice restaurant and the table next to me, the gentleman next to us stood up and, and told this kid off. But I, I, I went through a year of that. I went through a year of saying no, feeling the resistance, having people say really awful things. People call me a whore. You deserve to be raped, like, to my face. Yeah. And, so, and also, people like to touch me. So I've stopped going to public places where my back is exposed. Like I was at a bar at a Knicks game just getting a bottle of water, and a guy just came up behind me and just slid his hand in between my ass and my legs and whispered in my ear, can I have a photo? And I was just like, oh, my God, this is what people think of me. Like they think like, oh, they can do that to me. Okay, cool. I'm not going to be out and about as much as I used to be. It's incredible the liberties that guys think that they can take with porn stars because they think, oh, well, you know, she fucks on camera for a living, so she must want to fuck everybody in the world and the thing is is like in reality like if you work in porn like every girl like has their yes and their no list and they have like a small like yeah. You know, list of like I'm fucking the, Johnny Sins man well. Like I'm fucking ballers. You're right. Prince. Uh, yeah, I dudes. mean, you know, you're fucking like the same ten dudes <laughs> like all the time. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, you know, for, for the fact that these guys would think that like, you know, that you would just have sex with anybody who came their way, it's like that is absolutely not the case. And and you're playing a role. You're playing out a fantasy on camera. I mean, you're not gonna, you know, walk up to a movie star because they played a fucking paraplegic in a movie right. or something like that and but then just be like the I'm sorry you don't have legs you know I mean porn being in a kid's hands now with her phone yeah that's changed it all because yeah. they watch they consume so many hours of it that they think after a while it's in their bed in their head that it's like real you yeah. know what I mean it's like thinking if you saw um Julia Lewis Dreyfus you would call her Elaine like she's not yeah. Elaine you know what I yeah. mean so like it'd be like that but that was a bit jarring for me because I realized wow this younger generation doesn't realize women are and men are doing this for a living to make money yeah. and yes they get to enjoy the product but that does not mean that we are product right. for them to enjoy right my favorite things i realized since i retired is dating is extremely interesting that something i'm choosing not be. really to do too much i like to meet people through people but the couple times that i did just like meet someone and thought they were cute and thought okay we'll go on a date I always decided that those guys I would not have sex with on the first date. Right. The amount of emails that I receive that are filled with hate, that are so furious by the time they've gotten home from our date that I'd fuck just about anybody, but we went out on a date and they didn't fuck me and I didn't fuck them. Like this shit became comical. For a minute, I was telling my friends, I'm just going to date so that you guys can read the nasty messages I get 
when I don't fuck the guy on the first date. And it is a flawless, flawless run. There's not one guy that didn't pretty much threaten violence on me because I'm such a degenerate and fuck for money, but I wouldn't fuck him when he spent time with me. And I would just, I, would just, I never would respond to the first email because right. that makes people even matter. Right. So you let them, you let them go. So it's like 10 pages of emails. So you can read them on someone's fun dating podcast. And, and, and that really blew me away the most was I was like, okay, so now I know if I go out with somebody, they automatically think we are definitely having sex. So now sex is really the first and foremost thought in my mind is like, would I want to have sex with this guy? Would I want to do it the first day we were together? Okay, yes or no. Okay, yes or no. I can or can't go out with him, even if it's just for a cocktail, because I just don't need the fucking harassment. Right, right. Yeah, they get mad. They're it's- insulted. They take it extremely personally. And then they go through this whole list of like all, you've done gangbangs, and you wouldn't just have sex with me like... It just, it's not comparable. Yeah, you, yeah it's like, <laughs> I, you know, are you going to pay me 10 grand to fuck you? <laughs> it's, you don't get it. You're not, you're not putting two and two together, buddy. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah. And the thing is, it's like, I mean, you're performing for um, a camera for production. I mean, that's a difference, too, between, like, hooking and... Um, yeah. And performing, and yeah. not that, and honestly, like, I don't have anything against prostitution. Personally, I think it should be legal, so it can be regulated, so it can be safe, you know? I don't think the government should be able to tell you what you can do with your body. Um, but there is a big difference between um, doing prostitution and performing, you know? I 100%. mean, you are... You are you are performing in front of a crew. And you're creating jobs. When I was performing, I felt good about the fact that a photographer, yep. an assistant, um, whoever's going to make the art department for the for the cover for the DVD, right. whoever's going to put it up on the site, one scene is employing 25 people. Right. I felt good about that. Right. I couldn't have that same feeling of reward if I did privates. Same with being on the road. You're you know, stimulating the economy as right. opposed to just one man's penis. Right. Same with being on the road. The girls would say to me, oh, being on the road is so much work. And I'm like, yeah, but when you fill a club of 300 people and all of the girls make money and all the waitresses make money and everybody's happy in this club and this city and everybody's so excited, there is such a sense of pride yeah. in that you bring your power to another location location and you share it. And it's nice too. I mean, when you, when you produce something that's really beautiful and well done, you know, and you, you sit back and after all that hard work and, and you see it and you're just like, I made that. I mean, obviously yeah. not everything that we make is, gives you that kind of feeling, right. but you know. Right. There's some pictures I would see on the box cover and be like, oh, they chose that. Okay. It's tell not my. Tell me about, tell me about one of your funniest or maybe worst experiences on set. Oh, well, I'm going to say funniest because the last couple of years I was in the industry, I pretty much only shot for myself. Mm -hmm. So I was shooting my own productions that I released on DVD and have on my site. And I used to love booking interracial gangbangs for myself Mm -hmm. because I knew I was plotting my retirement. And in my own mind, I thought these are things that you might never be able to do again. Yeah, it's, you might never be able to meet it's hard seven to guys organize a gang that bang. all can be available on the same day right. that like each other, that aren't freaked out by each right. other, that can get hard, right. <laughs> that can do this, yeah. that you feel safe with, that aren't going to kill you. So, like, I found myself really going out of my way to shoot these interracial gangbang movies. And when I would get everybody there, we would be hanging out. And I would always find myself giggling because I'm like, this is like the greatest date because we get to socialize. You know, they'd all be sitting there watching me do my pretty girls. And that's my moment to like be flirting with all of them. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, this is really going to happen. And this could be like your last two of your whole life that you ever have this many guys just fawning over you together. That like, It just doesn't work with everybody. You right, know? right. And so they would always have a ton of fun. And uh, the one, one I did, I asked them to... I pretended they were movers. I love to set up the scenarios as well. So I pretended they were movers. Then I saw them moving furniture at a house down the street. And I asked them to come to my house after. And then I had like this little ottoman. (laughs) And I just wanted them to move the ottoman. But I wanted to be on the ottoman. Of course, I answered the door in lingerie. You know what I mean? So like they're carrying me around in this ottoman. And we're all just trying to shoot it and not laugh. And them not drop me because I'm in this ottoman. It was just like one of those things that... Should have taken five minutes, but took like two hours because yeah. we're having such a good time with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and those moments were fun because in my mind, I knew that part of the excitement, you know, I'm just uh, sexually adventurous. And part of that was going to be I would have to let go of it when I retired. And I do have a couple of friends that I reached out to before retirement. And I said, you know, 
I'm going to need you to facilitate some extracurricular activities like sharing with some of your friends, you know, things like this, just some niceties because I'm passing all this up yeah. and I'm going to miss it. Yeah. And and it's important to me. So I've been able to have some, but I don't think I'll ever have another seven guy gang bang like that. Aww. Super sad. Unless I just got all the performers together and said, hey, you want to hang out on Friday night? <laughs> Are you all available? Cool. My house. I'll make dinner. <laughs> that would be a very large dinner that you would have to it make. Would, and I wouldn't people. be able to eat because I'd be doing deep. So, yeah, you know? yeah, that's true. Well, that's <laughs> God, that would be awful. Oh, just the things I got really good at towards the end of my career. I was like, man, I'm just really getting good at this DP thing. And I don't know how easy they are to come by in real life. You know, so I actually, I have a DP. I had, got dp for my first time <gasps> the last <sighs> year, but but it, I've never been with two guys. Okay. So um, it was with uh, my boyfriend. And um, actually, this is, um, this is a perfect opportunity for me to um, promote this product because it's fucking awesome. It's called The Perfect Fit, and it's the strap-on dildo. And it's... It's the best. It's the best one I've ever used on set. All the girls that have used it love it. Because you know how, like, strap-on dildo scenes can be insanely uncomfortable and very painful? I have one that comes with really painful. cute boy shorts, and they fit really well, but your ass can't be hanging out. Because otherwise, it's all these straps, and, yeah. have, and they leave marks, and they exactly. mark the girl up for exactly. photos. Exactly, and, like, the dick, like, and it, like, flops around, oh. so it doesn't really, like, stay stationary, and it's, like, hard. So, anyways, this thing's great, and the sides are stretchy, like, elastic, like a jock strap, okay. and you can kind of adjust it Makes to how sense. you want it. And so, underneath the actual, like, penis part is a hole so the guy can put his stuff through the hole and then there's the dildo on top oh, this is and fantastic. so you can get fucked in both holes with the dildo in the butt and the penis in the vagina this is fantastic. and we did it and it was amazing because i had never been dp before it called again it's called the perfect fit i'm gonna definitely be ordering one of yeah those. they're they're and they're a great company they actually sent me um a bunch of free ones i'll give one oh for you. my gosh but this is this it is was amazing because like i've never i've always had that fantasy fantasy of being DP, but I've never, and I, I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I've never been with two guys. I feel like I, I couldn't handle it. It would be like too much for me. I got like, you. I like the, you know, like I like the fantasy, but like okay. the reality I think would just be like awkward. And because, you know, I don't work in porn and I don't do scenes, it's hard to find two dudes that of course, w- w- want to do that. You know what I mean? At the same time. And, and, so. they, and, they're, and they're comfortable with each other. Cause you right. know, when you're booking one of those scenes, you have to ask the guys like, are you cool with this guy? Cause he's going to be in the scene. Yeah. You know? They yeah. have to be cool. <gasps> That's fantastic. Yeah. And it's special that you did it with your boyfriend. Yeah. And so it was um, It was really fun. I would highly recommend it. Yeah. I explain to women all the time, the DP sensation is just something very different. And, you know, a lot of women will try it for the first time with a toy and mm-hmm. their guy. And that's a great way with the strap-ons even better. Yeah. Even better because he's got to be really coordinated to be using the toy at the same time. But it yeah. does work. I've done it that way. Yeah. Yeah, so it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, the sex capades did slow down a bit, Holly, after retirement. It's not the same as when a director has it set up for you at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. And you know, know you're right? shooting at Bosch. I know. You know what I'm saying? Like, now it's like, <laughs> I've got to map this out. We've got to sync schedules. Who's going to be where? What time, you know? Yeah. A little bit more work. Yeah, I know. But I'm making it happen. Do you miss it at all? I do. I miss shooting. I miss being on set. It's the in-between I don't miss. Mm. I miss... Being on stage and being in front of my fans at the meet and greet Mm -hmm. on the road. But I don't miss the agents who are very disrespectful to the women in the business Mm -hmm. and who do not know our value and who don't want us to know our value because Mm -hmm. then you might want more than what they think they want to work for you to get. And then the set thing is I loved it once I was in my quiet space shooting my stills and then getting ready to do the sex scene. It's, again, the in-between, whether it's... We've been very lucky to work with Rosalinda with makeup, who yeah. is a wonderful woman. But there's a lot of makeup artists in the business who gossip a bit. There's a lot of directors in the business who gossip a bit. And so when there was that gossip on set, it cluttered my mind and took me out of my fantasy. Like, I yeah. don't even like to touch my phone when I was on set. I yeah. would just like to do my thing. And so it's like what I had to go through to get to that magical moment sometimes derailed me more than than I like. There's just yeah. that negativity. And I think, you know, you know this. I'm getting older in the business. And having more empathy and and being more concerned about women and thinking long term, there's some people that just break your heart. And there were times where I was on set where I'd see a girl that I hadn't seen in a while and I realized she's using drugs or she's not in a good way. Mm -hmm. And you carry it with you. Yeah. And I feel like there was just a lot of negativity that for some reason was starting to stick to me that didn't stick to me before. And, Mm -hmm. and, And so it exhausted me. But the... 
What I've managed to do this year was realize I'm going to start doing some events again so I can be in front of my fans again and I can be talking with them. Trade shows, Exotica, Sexpo in Australia. I can take those little steps going into nightclubs and taking photos. I want that interaction. I miss that interaction. Right. Um, Everyone's asking me to direct right now and produce for them. And, you know, that's something that I feel myself really cautiously looking at, but for some reason not jumping at. And they've been asking for six months, so clearly I don't want to do it if that's... Yeah, if it's taking it. you that long. And they're offering me money and I'm saying no to it. Yeah. You know, it's like, clearly you don't want to do this because, yeah. you know. Right. Um, so there's things I miss and things I don't, you know. Yeah. But more than anything, I have a great sense of pride, just like I said earlier giggling when I was on the spin bike this morning thinking the only fucking thing I set my alarm clock for is a spin class like good for you girl that's, that's I what know. I said to myself this morning good for you pat your fucking self on the back <laughs> <laughs> I know I am like I'm so jealous when I you know when you were telling me about you know just how your your new life is and how you you don't have all that that crazy stress on you you know from trying to produce and survive and in this environment, you know, and it's changed so much now and there's so much less money in porn, even though like more and more people are watching it. And it's, um, yeah, and it's just, you know, and people I'm struggling to make budgets work. And yeah. it's just like, it is just like every day I feel like it's a battle. And you, people don't realize on your end what you're doing, the five to six to 10 hours of phone calls to organize one thing. And that's just locking in everyone's dates. Oh, yeah. And now you've got to find the matching talent. And now you've got to speak to this person. It is a task machine of a business. There's a lot to do to get one thing done. And if you're trying to do that three to five times a week, and then you're also trying to get in those phone calls, and then you're also trying to edit those photos, and you're also trying to submit these things, it becomes an 18-hour day. It's it's crazy. I mean, I just feel like I work all the time because it's just, yeah, exactly what you said, you know, like, I mean, I've had clients ask me like, oh, well, why do you charge this much? You know, you're just like shooting it, it for one day. Da, da, da. I'm like, it is not a one day thing. It is not I a one day thing. I have to book all of the shoots. I have to usually go out and buy and source props. I have to go find the location. I have to go get the wardrobe. I have to. Which is a ton of errands in Los Angeles, which take longer than any other city uh, in the U.S. I swear to God, I would get Traffic more alone. things in life done. I'd be further in my life, in my career. I swear if it wasn't for LA traffic yeah. because it takes all fucking day to run like two, two goddamn errands. Just a park can take you 25, 30 minutes. Sometimes I'll take an Uber because I don't want to drive around 30 minutes taking to get a spot. Yes. Like if you're going to Hollywood Boulevard to buy stuff. When Oh my gosh. So when we went, so Lisa and I went to a comedy show um, the other day. We saw Kate Quigley, who was hilarious. And, and the one thing that she said that totally stuck to me, she goes, you have been looking for parking for so long <laughs> that you just start to justify <laughs> the cost of a parking ticket. And I was like, fuck yes. I have 100% done that. I'd be like, fuck it. I'll just get a fucking yeah, $65 parking whatever. ticket. Because like, I'm fuck losing it. time right now. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. And I think that, you know, the viewers out there that enjoy your product and, and look at all the beautiful photos, you have a great fan base of fans that just love to look at your work and your Instagram. My fans so are so, so nice to me. But there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. And then you've got to move all of your stuff into the location and find the right light and set it up and make sure there's no refrigerator running if you're shooting video. There's no airplanes flying over or motorcycle going going by like oh my god <laughs> dude like people don't understand how much longer it takes to shoot an outdoor scene because i have to keep yes! stopping for fucking planes yes! like sir or like you know ne- the leaf blower goes yes! on next door i mean it's just like yeah how many times i've walked over naked to bribe the, the lawnmower guys next door to have yeah. their lunch right now so that we could shoot this scene or and forget then- <laughs> it like i will purposely like not shoot in the hollywood hills just because there's always construction going on because yeah. people are always like rebuilding and like right. tearing down and, like it's the worst it's the worst and you could walk outside all day and not realize you hear a plane. Yeah. But when you're waiting for a pop shot, fuck, oh, dude, and you start to hear a plane, you're and gonna stop that pop shot. Yeah, but like, or or not, or not, and just shoot through it because, like, once that's coming, it's yeah. coming. Right. You can't tell the guy, hold that for two more seconds. We got a plane. Yeah. <laughs> just hold it. Just hold your comeback. So there's a lot of elements, but yeah, I miss it. Um, but yet I knew it was time to do something different. And I knew it was time to restructure my schedule. Yeah. And I was just a workaholic in the business because I loved it so much and now yeah. I'm in bed every night between 9 30 10 at the latest yeah you know now it's like I'm living for tonight because it's game one of the NBA playoffs and I can sit on my couch remember I'd be at strip clubs Holly I would be on stage dancing while watching the game and all my fans <laughs> knew it and I would spin around and flirt with some customers for me then I turn around oh my god and then once it was commercial <laughs> they go to commercial I'm like okay I can dance I'm committed now you know what I mean I'm on stage committed as soon as guys at a foul line I'm like oh my god it's tied up right now he's at the foul line like <laughs> now I can actually 
watch games from the That's comfort amazing. of my couch. That's amazing. While live tweeting about it on commercial, like this little tiny shit that has made such a difference in my life. And just being more present in every single thing that I do. You know, I I go to this little jewelry store by my place, and this 86-year-old guy has been there since I've lived there in 2005. I don't want him to die because I don't know where I'm going to take my watches, of course. But I always go to visit him, and it's nice that I'm at the place in my life where we can chat for a couple of minutes so I can bring him over a coffee. And we could talk about, you know, the history is not It's one of those places that have all the whole old black and white Hollywood eight by tens. You know those old yeah. Hollywood oh, yeah, places yeah, yeah. in the valley? You're like, oh, none of these people are alive anymore. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, but, you know, it's just neat to be this young as I felt old three years ago in the business. Mm-hmm. I now feel young yeah. in this world. Yeah, because you're not comparing yourself to 18-year-olds. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Totally different. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. I'm so excited people are going to get to hear your voice and learn about you. Yay! And I'd like to come on one day and interview you. Oh, shit, girl. Flip it up. Flip the script. Oh, shit. All right, everyone. Well, Lisa Ann, thank you so much. You guys can get a copy of her book, The Life, on Amazon. And on my store, which is thelifelisaann.com. And then also tell us where we can find you on social media, website, all that stuff. Twitter at The Real Lisa Ann, Instagram at The Real Lisa Ann. I just started snapping, and now I have the mantra of, do you remember that song, Just Give Them Something to Talk About, Bonnie yes. Raitt? Yes, yes. For some reason, now that's my mantra when I wake up, give them something to snap about. So yeah. I have this snap pressure, yeah. this whole new Snapchat pressure. I have to do something snappy. And yesterday I was like, nothing you did today was snap worthy. I yeah. didn't snap once. I feel the same way. I <laughs> I'm like, boring. I, I run errands. I feel the same way. I'm like, who the fuck cares <laughs> about like, you know, my, my dogs or like how my like day at the chiropractor went. But people care. I feel it's like the, the, weirdest the jig thing. is up. People are either going to love what I'm doing or realize my life is so fucking boring that it's like watching paint dry if that happens you can just go to my website thelisaann.com and you can fulfill everything that you loved about me before you realize my life is boring <laughs> <laughs> well lisa you definitely are not boring and thank you so much for coming on okay.